Florida's warm, humid environment makes Florida a compatible location to mass produce numerous plant species. These ideal conditions are also suitable for the development of a wide variety of plant pathogens, including bacteria, fungi, and viruses. I'm Dr. DeBusk, and this video will cover only a few of the common ornamental plant diseases encountered in Florida. Let's start with bacterial diseases. Crown gall is characterized by the formation of galls that resemble tumors. Galls may form on the surface of stems or internally within stems, causing large swollen sections. Galls can also form on roots. The first observable symptom is swelling of the plant tissue. This is usually associated with a wound, therefore the initial swelling is often dismissed as normal callus formation. Within a matter of weeks after initial infection, this swelling takes on a spherical shape and becomes light green to tan in color. The gall then becomes irregular in shape and turns dark brown or black because of plant cells dying on the gall's surface. As the gall enlarges, it crushes the plant's conducting tissue and blocks water movement to the foliage. Agrobacterium can live in the soil without a host for a number of years. Avoid contact with unsterilized native soil. Root chewing insects can inflict wounds that can become infected. No known bactericides are effective against crown gall. A strict sanitation program is the best method of disease management. Obtain clean, disease-free stock plants. During pruning, cutting utensils should be sterilized between each cut. When removing galls from plants, cuts should be made several inches below the gall tissue. Small water-soaked angular lesions appear on the leaves as the first sign of infection of Xanthomonas leaf spot. These lesions become chlorotic and eventually turn brown. When infections are severe, leaf drop may occur. Summer conditions with warmer temperatures and a wet, humid environment favor xanthomonas development. Minimize overhead watering. Infected lesions exude bacteria that are easily splashed from plant to plant. Minimize worker handling of plants. Bacteria exuded onto leaves can easily be moved between plants by workers, especially if plants are wet. Eliminate diseased plants. The first line of defense with this disease is exclusion, which can best be achieved if plants are disease-free. Refer to UFIFAS EDIS publication PP202, Professional Disease Management Guide for Ornamental Plants for Chemical Control Options. Active ingredients include copper products, phosphatidyl aluminum, and phosphorus acid. Pseudomonas leaf spot has many similarities to xanthomonas leaf spot. Pseudomonas forms circular lesions on some species and angular lesions on others. These lesions are water-soaked and randomly spaced on the leaves. The warm temperatures and high humidity commonly seen during summer favor the pathogen. The first line of defense with this disease is exclusion, therefore eliminating plants showing disease. Minimize overhead watering since bacteria are easily splashed from plant to plant and can reinfect via stomatal openings. Minimize worker contact, especially if plants are wet. The same pesticides for xanthomonas leaf spot work for pseudomonas leaf spot. Fire blight infects members of the rosaceae family, which includes numerous species of trees and shrubs and landscapes. The bark at the base of blighted twigs becomes water-soaked, then dark, sunken, and dry. Cracks may develop at the edge of the sunken area. Young twigs and branches die from the terminal end and appear burned or deep rust colored. Branches may be bent resembling what is commonly referred to as shepherd's crook. Dead leaves and fruit remain on the branches. The bacteria spread rapidly through the plant tissue in warm temperatures, 65 degrees Fahrenheit or higher, in humid weather. Prune out infected branches 8 inches below the damage. Avoid heavy nitrogen fertilization, especially in summer, when succulent growth is most susceptible to fire blight infection. Chemical control is not always effective and needs to be applied preventively. Bacterial leaf scorch is a chronic, eventually fatal disease. The pathogen infects the xylem where it partially blocks the flow of water to the leaves, resulting in leaf scorch symptoms. Symptoms include premature leaf browning, marginal necrosis, and defoliation. Infected trees leaf out normally the following year, however, leaves on the, a few more branches turn prematurely brown in late summer. These events repeat themselves over a period of several years until the entire tree turns prematurely brown. Some researchers working with this disease suggest that leaf scorch symptoms are more severe during times when other stresses are placed on the tree. Timing of symptom development in mid to late summer is often associated with various moisture and heat stresses occurring that season. 
There is no cure for bacterial leaf scorch, so one should expect diseased trees to be gradually lost over the years. Because infected trees decline gradually, it may be 5 to 10 years before there are many dead limbs and branches present. In the meantime, tree owners can provide good growing conditions for the trees to prolong their survival and to enhance their aesthetic value. Chemical control, including tree injections, have not proven to be a long-term solution. Now I'm going to mention some of the common fungal diseases. The Sphoropsis gall fungus is a serious disease throughout Florida. This gall appears on bottle brush, holly, oleander, and wax myrtle. The fungus causes swollen woody galls in the branches of holly and bottle brush. Sphoropsis gall also forms witch's broom growth on wax myrtle, oleander, holly, and other woody plants. Factors favoring the disease are periods favoring new shoot expansion. The disease is disseminated by wind and rain. During dry conditions, prune branches at least six inches below where symptoms are seen. Phytophthora and Pythium infections commonly attack the root systems of landscape ornamental plants. Plants infected with either of these pathogens exhibit yellowing of leaves, wilting, root dieback, root discoloration, and sloughing of root tissue. Under wet conditions, the foliage may exhibit brown to black lesions. Mycelial growth in the soil or on stems is rarely observed with either Phytophthora or Pythium infections. Factors favoring the disease are wet conditions, saturated soils. Use well-drained soil mixes. Avoid saturated conditions. Discard plants that have disease symptoms. Sterilize used pots and trays. Drenches with fungicides such as nifoxam, pyclostrobum, and phosphatyl aluminum are effective. Anthracnose is characterized by necrotic spots on the leaf surface. Under human conditions, brown masses of spores can form into concentric rings. Necrotic spots eventually become dark brown and the leaves may fall off. Anthracnose can also cause tip dieback. The disease favors wet conditions and high humidity in the summer months. This disease frequently occurs after misuse of pesticides has caused tissue damage. Minimize overhead irrigation and exposure to rainfall. A number of fungicides can effectively control anthracnose, such as chlorothalonil, strobilurins, neem oil, and many others. With rhizoctonia, young tender stems are girdled, become water-soaked, and are unable to support the plant's weight. The term damping off is used to describe these classic symptoms. Water-saturated soils are conducive to disease development. Rhizoctonia can spread within soil without having a host plant present. It produces constricted small mats of tightly woven mycelia called sclerotia. Irregular in shape, brown in color, and resembling soil particles, Rhizoctonia sclerotia provide a seed-like mechanism for the fungus to survive unfavorable conditions such as drought or cold weather. These small sclerotia are one of the ways the fungus spreads. Use disease-free transplants. Many fungicides are effective against rhizoctonia, such as strobilurins, flutidioxanil, and triflumazole. The southern blight pathogen grows as a white feathery mycelial mat along the soil surface and on plant parts. Rhizoctonia, on the other hand, always produces brown-colored mycelia. The mycelia eventually forms small, circular brown sclerotia. Sclerotia resists penetration by fungicides. Growth of this fungus is especially rapid when soils are wet and weather is hot. Southern blight is common in warm climates. Use disease-free plants to exclude fungal access. Plants that have disease symptoms should be discarded and the rest should be treated with a fungicide drench. Controlling outbreaks of southern blight with fungicides is difficult, but a few have been found effective, such as strobilurins and flutidioxanil. Powdery mildew infects young succulent tissues and extra new growth. Water sprouts on the main branches of plants. This mildew covers entire plant surfaces. It is visible on the top surfaces of leaves. Downy mildew favors young succulent tissues also. However, it appears only on the underside of leaves. Plants trapping water vapor from moist soil surfaces creates favorable conditions for disease development. Mildew diseases usually appear during fall and spring when humid periods accompany cool nights and warm days. Rain and prolonged irrigation are ideal conditions for mildew diseases. Powdery mildew can be suppressed by planting landscapes in open, sunny areas and not crowding plants to allow air movement. Do not irrigate plants at night and do not over-fertilize. Remove infected leaves and other plant parts. Many fungicides are effective for treating. Many ornamental plants are susceptible to numerous species of fungi that cause leaf spots. Lesions usually 
start out small, but can vary in size and have unique features. In severe cases, leaves subsequently turn yellow and darker and finally lead to defoliation. Several common examples include black spot of rose, pseudocercospora leaf spot, and oak leaf blister. Many fungicides are available for treatment. Lastly, let's talk about a couple of viral diseases. Rose rosette disease causes red discoloration of new growth, excessive thorniness, elongated shoots, deformed blooms, which is brooms of shoots, and ultimately death of the plant. A mite vectors this disease by its feeding activity. In early spring, the vectoring mites migrate onto developing shoots where females lay eggs. Young mites develop within the leaf folds of new shoots and underleaf petioles. The mites do not possess wings, so they move from plant to plant by attaching to insects and being dispersed by wind. Once a rose is identified infected, the plant should be removed immediately by burning or disposing of it in a sealed plastic bag. Because the disease can possibly spread to a neighboring rose plant, removal of the infected rose should include removal of its roots as well. Pruning of roses may eliminate mites and eggs, which are found in the crevices of cane petioles in the new growth. It is unclear which pesticides are effective to manage this mite. Because the mite is hidden in the buds of the growing tips, coverage is difficult to achieve. However, it is known there are natural enemies of many mite species, so the use of soft pesticides such as light horticultural oils, sulfur, soaps, etc. may preserve the naturally occurring natural enemies. Hundreds of plant species are susceptible to INSV, impatience necrotic spot virus. One or more of the following symptoms may be present on a plant infected with INSV, stunting, ring spots, brown to purple spots on leaves or stems, stem browning, cankers, flower breaking, and plant death. Symptoms of INSV can easily be confused with symptoms of diseases caused by other viruses, fungi, bacteria, or nutritional disorders. Western flower thrips vector this disease by its feeding activity. High nitrogen fertility that stimulates new tender growth in the presence of weeds and thrips in the landscape favor this disease. For control, remove and destroy infected plants. Control weeds in the landscape as they serve as alternate hosts for both the pathogen and thrips. There are insecticides registered for the control of thrips. The primary role of the Florida Extension Plant Diagnostic Clinics, FEPDC, is to determine whether symptoms in submitted plant samples involve an infectious causal agent, for example, fungus, bacterium, or virus, or other cultural or environmental factor that causes similar symptoms. The goal of the FEPDC system is to educate clientele by providing plant disease and disorder diagnosis and recommendations for preventative and therapeutic measures. The FEPDC is a fee-based service provided by any Florida resident by the Plant Pathology Department of the Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences, IFAS, University of Florida, in conjunction with the Cooperative Extension Service. For more information, the nearest laboratory and feeds, see Sample Submission Guide for Plant Diagnostic Clinics of the Florida Plant Diagnostic Network, available at the address shown here. In this video, I hope you learned a little more about ornamental plant diseases in Florida.